Hi sisters and friends and bookkeeping mamas, it's Trevana Parker here. As you know, I'm a bookkeeping mama and I aim to be your bookkeeping advocate to help you on the journey of all things finance, uh, starting your bookkeep bookkeeping business, uh, going to bookkeeping interviews, uh, but most importantly, the personal finance literacy that will help to make any venture that you decide to jump on. As you can see, today's a Tuesday, and on Tuesdays, I like to re um, present lifestyle bookkeeping videos. And lifestyle bookkeeping is basically taking the concept of bookkeeping, which is categorizing transactions, reconciling accounts, and producing financial reports, and applying them to our lives. So basically making sure that any goals that we have in our lives we have the category, uh, the transactions to prove that we're reaching or aiming toward those goals because we can have goals and then the transactions that we're doing in our lives, the events that we're doing in our lives don't match up to those goals. We never understand that if we're not actually monitoring it. That's all bookkeeping is monitoring what you're doing, what's going in, what's coming out. If I say I want to lose weight, if I say I want to save money, do my actions really convey that message? So that's lifestyle bookkeeping and today is a Tuesday. Let me adjust this. It's up too high. Today is a Tuesday, so now it's too low. Just want to kind of make sure my head's in there and today's a Tuesday. Um so we're going to get into some lifestyle bookkeeping. And I wanted to talk to you guys about an IRA CD. Now I had never heard of an IRA CD until recently. And so I wanted to do a deep dive into understanding it. So I must put a disclaimer, as you guys know, I am going, well, as you'll see, I'm starting to put disclaimers at the bottom of the videos because um, although I aim to do a lot of research and I aim to make your lives easier by going and understanding some of these concepts, I am not a certified financial advisor. Um, you know, I know there was one point where I was trying to become a certified financial advisor um, with, I think it's S series 10 or series seven or something along those lines where you're qualified to start, you know, helping people trade with the stock market and things like that. I'm not that, but I will do research. I love questions because sometimes something's not on my mind. I never would have thought about it, but a question will come and lo and behold, there it is. So let me go ahead and get into the topic of IRA CDs again. I'm at the very beginning stages of learning about this. So take this information and then add to it as you see fit. So I have a lot of notes here, so bear with me. So there is an IRA CD. An IRA is an individual retirement account. Now the individual retirement account is individual because you're doing it on your own. So you have retirement accounts, retirement accounts that are connected to your work. So the most popular would be a 401k, but there is a, I want to say 457 for police officers or like government workers. There's also the 403B. I think that's for educators and things like that. But those are with work. Uh, they have um, a maximum that you can put in. I want to say around 19,000, 19,500 that you can put in. And um, they have the traditional governmental retirement account um Characteristics. So for example, you can't take any money out before you're 59 and a half. Otherwise, you're going to have tax implications as well as, well, you're going to always have tax implications, but you're going to have penalties. Penalties for taking the money out before you're 59 and a half. Uh, they're tax deferred generally. And so therefore, um, you don't pay taxes until you take the money out. Um, I think the 401k might also have required minimal, minimum distributions and a requirement um, required minimum distribution is when you are forced to take money out on an annual basis once you reach a certain age, which I believe is 72 years old. So, but an, an IRA is an individual retirement plan. So you get that on your own outside of your employer. Now, the IRA has two different um, options. You have the traditional IRA and then you have a Roth IRA. So with the traditional IRA, it's pre-tax dollars. That means your money is not taxed when it's going in. It's not taxed as it's accruing. It's only taxed when you take the money out. And therefore, it's tax deferred as well. Um, there's no income limit. You can make as much money as you want 
and still be able to put money into your traditional IRA. There is a max that you can put in for an IRA. Um, currently, it should be $6,500 or $6,500 if you are under the age of 50. And once you reach the age of 50, then you can start to put in $7,500 annually. Again, you can't touch the money without penalties uh, before you're 51 and 59 and a half. And then there are the re required minimum distributions. A Roth IRA, on the other hand, is um, after tax dollars. Um, so it has tax-free growth, which means you, you're already taxed on the money. It has tax-free growth. And when you take the money out, you don't get uh, penalized any taxes. Again, you have to wait until you're 59 and a half. Um, there is an income limit though with the IRA. I don't have the exact numbers right now, but there are like brackets of, you know, where you can put money in and, and it'll phase out. They have a phase out system where if you're making the lowest amount of money, uh, you can put the maximum in if you're, you know, and as you creep up the ladder of finances, increased salary, whatnot, you can put less and less money in. I'm always leery of things that tell me how much and how little I can invest, but that's another story. Uh, again, 59 and a half, or you're going to get the penalties, but they do not have a required minimum distribution, which means that even if you reach a certain age, uh, you don't have to start taking the money out with, um, or you'll get a penalty. So that being said, an IRA is just an investment vehicle. Okay. It's an investment vehicle and you can choose which investments go inside. And a CD is one such investment along with stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Those are all investments that can go in an IRA. So let's talk about that CD. Um, a CD is a low risk investment, low risk somewhat, but it's low risk. It's very low risk. I'll get into the somewhat in just a moment, but it's very low risk and you can get that at your bank or your credit union. I did see somewhere where you can also get it at a brokerage account, but they're really easily accessible at your bank or your credit union. And they are FDIC or NCUA insured up to $250,000. And so as with all of your money that you put into the bank, they're going to use about 90% of your money to go out and make business investments. We already talked about this before. Your money is going to be used by the bank to help them grow their money. So one way that they reward you to utilize your money is by giving you interest. So a CD has interest payments. And so um, it offers you a greater return on your investment than a checking account or a savings account. And the reason is because they lock your money up. So um, a CD has different time frames that you can lock your money up. They have some have one month, they have three months, six months. You can go all the way up to 10 years. And um, let's see, yeah, it used to be that back in the day, the longer you locked your money up, the higher the rate. And it's still somewhat that way. However, there have been these great offers, these low barriers of entry to CDs, high interest rate uh, savings accounts, no minimum deposit uh, for this high savings account. So we'll talk about that another time. Let's get back to the CDs. And you'll see why I'm mentioning that in just a moment. But they have like one month, um, and it has like the highest rate, you know, put your money in for a month and it has the highest rate. And I think that there are two things. They're trying to appeal to people who don't want all their money locked up, but also, and this is just me, as I said in another video, we have an imaginary money system right now. You know, back in the day they had gold and silver, they traded. Now we have what we call fiat money. You know, we print out this, this bill and we say it means this amount of money, but there's inflation. So yesterday it meant this month and th this much, and now it means this much. It's, 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 a, it's, it's not real currency. And so now we have online money floating through the air kind of currency. And one of the things that's very important to understand is that, you know, have you ever, 
this is this will make it more clear and this might be a longer video we can just I, I don't even think I'm gonna edit anything out but have you ever noticed that a company can take money out of your account immediately but if there's a discrepancy and they are trying to put money back into your account they'll say it'll take seven to ten business days this is very important <laughs> the reason it's important is because i want you guys to understand that these companies and the banks included have a lot of power over the money that's sitting in the bank with this electronic system that we have so i have a thought process that the money that's going into the bank the, it's easier for us to part with our money and um, it's easier for them to do what they want. If they want to lock up our accounts, they can. If they want to take it, you know, a longer time to give us our money, they can because we are relying on their system. So that's my thought about this low barrier to entry. I'll leave it there for now. All right, so let me go ahead and see where we are with our notes. All right, we already talked about that. We already talked about that. Okay, so a CD, again, is a low risk investment. You know exactly what you're getting. It has a fixed rate. Uh, it's, it's not risky at all, unless you need to touch the money. So when you're creating a CD, you have to really make sure that you um, do not need access to the money. So canceling the CD has penalties. Uh, I'm not exactly sure exactly how the penalties work. That's something that's unique to every credit union or bank, uh, but they do have penalties, which of course, if you have a penalty, that means it's no longer a low risk. It's not super high risk by any stretch of the imagination. You're not gonna be losing any money um you know other than the fact that you've lost this um the interest maybe that you're going to get but also the penalty so that's something that you should take into account because that then it's no longer like a low risk and defeats the whole purpose and it turns your attempted investment into a loss um but the good news is that i did find some places have no penalty cds which to me just becomes like a savings account so i think that's really strange again I'm always leery when all of a sudden the entrance barriers are really low and we're parting with our money with such great ease uh, because I do know that they change these numbers rather rapidly as far as, um, you know, interest rates and things like that. So let me get some better lighting here. I don't want my lighting so dark. All right, that should help. Okay. All right. So back to the IRA CD. Gelling these two um, worlds together can be beneficial to some, especially if they're getting into retirement. So again, it's low risk. It doesn't yield the greatest returns. And so it's for people who are really close to retirement. Uh, they recommend younger people will have um, more high risk investment opportunities or vehicles. So when you have an IRA CD, you have to combine the rules and the regulations for each separate part of the function or the vehicle. So you do have the max amount that you can put in like an IRA. You do have the penalty for the early withdrawal for like the CD, but also the penalty for an early withdrawal if you're too young uh, for the IRA. Um, neither the IRA, the CD or an IRA CD are suitable for someone who needs their cash immediately. So if you're considering an IRA CD, I want you to think of four things. We have the rate that you need to be considering, the minimum deposit required, the maturity date, and also any associated fees uh, that are particular to your specific financial institution. And then you also need to consider your current situation. So for example, uh, do you have access to money outside of this vehicle? Because if you're gonna be setting your money aside and you're looking at it as an investment vehicle, you should be prepared to not touch it. 
So the things that I usually recommend is just consider what you're looking like. I consider um, having your emergency fund, um, your emergency, your super emergency fund. Now that fund is like, it's available for you. And it's like, I need this money to be available. I have to get out of here for whatever reason. All I have are the clothes on my back. So I recommend having that at home. I would recommend 500 to to $1,000 um, emergency fund. And that can be in a credit card. That can be however however it works for you. Um, it could be cash and safe under your mattress. I don't know. But have that money available to you in the case of a super duper emergency. And then there is the regular emergency fund. And that's also available immediately. If I need to fix my car, if I need a deductible for this flood in my house, something along those lines. I would recommend that being at least one month salary or uh, your minimum de deductible. You know, if you have a certain deductible for your home, your car, I think roof deductibles are different from whatever's inside of the home. So something along those lines. And then also so a survival, survival fund, fund is a fund that you have that is about three to six months uh, living expenses. That way, if you lose your job or, you know, your husband loses his job or anything happens, uh, your family is prepared to live and still let that investment grow in the city. So those are two worlds that have joined together. You have an IRA and it's the investment vehicle where you can put things in and you put the city into the IRA. Again, it's better for people who are nearing retirement, not so much for people who are um, younger age, but it's low risk and it works. Now, having said that, sometimes there are gonna be beneficiaries for IRAs. And so I wanted to talk about some of the ways in which that will work. So let me just see my notes again. Okay, so the, um, I don't know why I had that note there. But there are no problems once you have a beneficiary with, oh, name a beneficiary. So if you have an IRA and you name someone a beneficiary, um, you can also name some beneficiaries after that person. So for example, um, you have a beneficiary, your child is a beneficiary. You can name someone who's a beneficiary if something happens to that child. So for example, you have a son or a daughter who you want to leave it to, but you don't trust their grandchildren or their children. So you don't want anything to happen to the, you know, if, if something happens to them, the money's going to go to their estate, which is probably going to go to their children. You can also name a, a, a beneficiary that the money goes to after that person. So maybe I wanted to go to this child, but if something happens to that child, then I wanted to go to this child or something happens to that child, I want to go to this child's grandchildren, something along those lines. There are no problems with the 59 and a half rule. Once you become a beneficiary, you don't have to wait. Um, there are three levels uh, currently for beneficiaries, and we're not going to talk about two of them. We're only going to really focus on one, but there's the eligible de designated beneficiary, the EDB, where that can be a surviving spouse, minor children, uh, someone who's chronically ill, or individuals that are not more than 10 years younger than the original owner of the policy. And so that can be like some siblings or something along those lines. Then there are the designated beneficiaries. Those are adult children, grandchildren, others that are 10 years or more younger. Um, and there's um, non-designated beneficiaries. These are not people. These are estates, trusts, or charities. So we're going to talk about the designated beneficiary. With the eligible de be eligible uh, designated beneficiary, they can stretch that out for the life for their their expected life. They can stretch out the funds and how they drip the money for their expected life. For non-designated beneficiaries like the trust or the estate or whatnot, they have to make sure that the funds are liquidated within five years of receipt or five years after the death of the original owner. For designated beneficiaries, which is where we're going to park, because many people are adult children, grandchildren, others 10 years um, or more younger, they have a 10-year rule. And this is currently a 10-year rule. There are some changes that were made, I want to say in 2022, 2023. But there's a 10-year rule, 
And ultimately, um, they have to have the funds liquidated within 10 years. The suggestion is to liquidate the funds consistently because it's going to be taxable income on your tax paperwork. So you'd rather liquidate the funds and have, you know, suppose you have $10,000 over five Let years. me go back. Well, you have $10,000 and you have 10 years to liquidate. So it would be easier financially if you took out $1,000 annually and pay the taxes on the five thousand, excuse me, on the thousand dollars annually, as opposed to waiting until that ten years and then paying taxes on that ten thousand dollars. That's something that they recommend doing it on a consistent drip. Now, here's the caveat, and I was having a really hard time trying to figure this part out. You have an IRA, and if the person who gave you the IRA was older than seventy-two years old which means that they were required to start taking re required minimum distributions on their IRA, you're required to take the money out immediately. And there was so, there was so much confusion for me as I looked at this because you have to take the money out the year. They have to take the money out each year or there, there are penalties. And so people were saying, as I, as I did the research, they were saying that even if someone passed at the end of the year, you're required to take the money out on their behalf or you're going to be penalized. And they were saying, you know, well, what if someone died at the end of December? They're still required to take the money out, even if they didn't even know the policy existed. And they were also saying that the IRS is not going to be super lenient with this. So I just... These government policies really caused me some great struggles. Um, what else? Oh, another issue <laughs> was that you have this CD and you're not supposed to touch the CD prematurely because, of course, it's an investment vehicle. If you guys hear my baby in the background screaming, I apologize, but it is what it is. You are supposed to keep this money in this investment vehicle until the maturity date, right? But you also have the fact that you need to be taking required minimum distributions on this IRA, which is the investment vehicle. So there were some really serious struggles I had with this IRA CD and trying to understand how all that worked. Um, again, they say that it's more suited for people who are just nearing the age of retirement or in retirement very low um, barrier to entry um, just yeah um, those are the thoughts that I have on the IRA CD I figured I would you know be a pretty smooth it would be a pretty smooth video until I got to those beneficiaries because there was so much to unpack there um, but again just to kind of uh, summarize it if you inherit an IRA CD and you are an adult child, a grandchild, or anyone more than 10 years younger than the person who um, has just recently deceased, you need to follow the 10-year rule. That means that all of the funds need to be liquidated from that account by the end of 10 years, December 31st of the 10th year following the person's um, passing. Uh, they recommend that you do it on a consistent drip because you will be taxed as income. Um, so make sure that you can handle that, the taxing. Um, and this can be a major problem for someone who inherits a great amount. But uh, make sure that you can um, manage the drip so that you're not taxed at the very end. Also, um, remember the required minimum distribution the annual require, required minimum distribution. So that's something to look into as well. And I think that's pretty much it. Again, guys, this is just my rough level of um, research. If you have following questions, you guys know I really like questions. So ask questions, put them in the comment section because those questions help other people to see the video. Um, the algorithm works that way. Questions, likes, subscribes, shares, they definitely help. So 
uh, that's what I have for you guys right now. Uh, again, I would have loved to give you super great, you know, detail, but I think this is a great start for all of us. So have any questions, let me know. You guys have a great day. Remember, I am here to help us to protect our families, nix our mortgages, defeat our debt, tame our taxes, make more and live free, all while still glorifying Christ. So hope you guys have a great day. Remember to keep your money safe, but more importantly, keep your soul safe. And if you have any questions about that, you can check in the description of the video. You guys have a great day. God bless you.